Welcome to the Bible Forum. I'm Warren Sprouse. You're here with me every Sunday night from 8 to 10 p.m. live. Many of you watch during the week and during the months. Got a question for you? Does life begin at conception? Stephen Jacobs, a University of Chicago PhD, has spent the last half decade fighting to gather and publish research related to the American abortion debate. During that time, he was ridiculed, mocked, and defamed, accused of committing academic dishonesty, politicizing science, and conducting his work with personal bias. He was compared to the Ku Klux Klan and in general painted as an unprofessional radical who was, in one academic's words, not deserving of a Ph. degree. Why? Well, simply because he asked thousands of scientists several questions about when they believe human life begins. He was doing his thesis, his paper. Questions one respondent referred to as a trap and another called horribly manipulative. The reality here is that these professors overwhelmingly agree with the pro-life position that human life begins at conception. Does that surprise you? Gathering the data, arguing it, and getting it published, however, was a crushing and drawn-out affair. This is secular academia, after all. The scholar did not want to discuss his situation on the record with any media prior to arguing his dissertation for fear of professional consequences. At one point, Jacob said an academic was concerned that any reporting done by the website The Fix on Jacob's work could be used by pro-life advocates. Duh. He said, I was told that my survey seemed like it was developed by the Ku Klux Klan. I was told that my work could expedite at the extinction of the human race. I was told that I should be ashamed of myself since I was damaging the represent, reputation of the University of Chicago. Jacobs was able to gather a staggering number of responses from the survey respondents. Those emails range from the affirmative to the immaterial to the aggressively vituperative. That means harshly critical. As well as a very poorly designed questionnaire. When in doubt, just attack the questionnaire. One critic said, biology deals with facts. When a life with value begins or ends is best decided by philosophers and ethicists. What? Philosophers and ethicists by definition are not all that, dealing all that much with facts. Another wrote, as a scientist, I agree that life begins at fertilization. But as a citizen of this democracy, I support a woman's right to choose. From that perspective, I adopt the opinion that life begins at first heartbeat. Yeah. Let your politics run your science. Another criticized Jacobs for referring to the two sides of the abortion debate as choice and pro-life. That professor requested that the terms be classified as choice and anti-choice. Pro-life being entirely too um, argumentative. Or is it revealing? At Jacob's dissertation defense, a former advise, advisor on this particular project pushed back against Jacob's thesis, stating that he was worried that pro-life people would use my work and that it would be a poor representation of the University of Chicago if that were to happen. Politics over reality or integrity. 
Jacob said he observed surprised expressions among the dissertation committee regarding that advisor's aggressive objections. After the argument was over, Jacob said he received comments suggesting that I must have a high pain threshold and commendations for withstanding the advisor's onslaught of attacks. Eventually, the dissertation was approved and Jacobs was awarded a PhD. Ultimately, he says, I think the University of Chicago should receive credit for not dismissing me as a student, for eventually approving my research, and for allowing me to graduate after writing a dissertation about fetal rights. It is possible that I wouldn't have been able to do this at another institution, so I'm grateful to everyone involved. So what was learned here? Negative reactions to the survey aside, Jacob's research revealed that whatever their politics, large majority, majorities of biology professors support the pro-life contention that human life begins at the moment of fertilization. Of the two implicit questions, posed by Jacobs, which asked biologists to respond to the contention that the development of a mammalian organism begins at the moment of fertilization, around 90% of the respondents answered in the affirmative. To the question that fertilization marks the beginning of a human life, fully three quarters of respondents said yes. Responses to the essay question, when does life begin, were also lopsided in favor of the pro-life position. Nearly 90% of very pro-life respondents answered that it begins at fertilization. Still nearly three quarters of pro-choice respondents answered the same. And around three-fifths of the very pro-choice respondents felt this way. So what does it all mean? It means as much as pro-choice pundits and activists argue that the question is in, effect, is in effect an unknowable one, the academic world is not that certain. Former Planned Parenthood CEO Cecile Richards, for instance, said several years ago, that according to OBGYNs with whom she had spoken, there is no specific moment when life begins. An article at Wired from several years ago also declared that, quote, science can't say when a baby's life begins, end of quote. But here's a first of its kind, large scale survey establishing the fact that the precise moment at which human life begins is knowable and by these academicians. Jacobs expressed the desire that the abortion debate move away from when life begins toward is it okay to kill unborn humans? Now that's doubtful. This puts it on a very emotional basis but the whole debate has become emotional rather than scientific. Evidence by the scientists who contributed to the report. A human's life begins at fertilization, they said. An abortion is the intentional killing of a human and thus should be recognized as homicide, Jacob says. The central question about abortion is, when is that homicide justifiable? Jacob said, let's stop debating whether a fetus is a human and start debating whether all humans have rights, and if so, how to balance one human's right to abort and another human's right to life. Now, along with this, and kind of as an aside, I throw you back to another generation, to Susan B. Anthony, 
Did you know that early feminists, including Susan B. Anthony, were deeply opposed to abortion? Today, Anthony is held up as the woman's patron saint where abortion is concerned. A surprisingly honest Saturday Night Live sketch from a couple years ago captured the shock of a group of progressive young ladies who, when they meet Anthony, are shocked to learn her less than progressive views on a woman's so-called right to choose. Anthony and other early feminists clearly stated why they opposed abortion. Besides calling it murder, they argued that abortion allows men to use women to satisfy their appetites and then throw them aside. Can I get an amen? In an 1875 speech entitled Social Purity, Anthony put abortion alongside, quote, breach of promise, divorce, adultery, bigamy, seduction, rape, wife murders, and infanticides, characterizing them all as evils perpetrated by men against women and children. Does the logic shock you? <laughs> if it does, it's because that's what's missing, at least today, almost everywhere. In an 1869 article in Anthony's newspaper, an anonymous author who most assume is Anthony herself, condemned abortion in no uncertain terms, laying it primarily at the feet of men, saying, quote, no matter the motive, whether love of ease or a desire to save from suffering the unborn innocent, the woman is awfully guilty who commits the deed. It will burden her conscience in life. It will burden her soul in death. But oh, thrice guilty is he who drove her to the desperation which impelled her to the crime. That was then, and this is now, and times change. What was once a feminist argument against abortion has become a talking point for it. A recent editorial in the Huffington Post entitled Access to Abortion Changes Cis Men's Lives Too makes exactly such a claim. Now, if you're not up to speed on gender theory lingo, cis is short for cisgender, which just means non-trans and non-gay. Why that word even exists is another story. In the Huffington Post piece, Emma Gray argues that abortion is good for straight men because it allows them to get rid of an unplanned child and get on with their educations and careers. She tells the stories of males, she says, I cannot call them men, who say that forced parenthood would have been a disaster for them. She remarks how lucky they were to live in states where their girlfriends could just visit an abortion clinic so they could dispose of the child and move on to more important things. As one pro-abortion journalist, she approvingly quotes, tweeted, behind millions of successful men is an abortion. They don't regret getting for their partner. Of course, the partner is the one who experiences it and very often never forgets it. Gray goes on, carrying an unintended pregnancy to term can mean giving up on professional and educational dreams. It can mean sacrificing financial stability. It can mean being tied to the wrong relationship forever. All things that should have been considered before you took your clothes off. And then she quotes these fathers who, along with their partners, chose abortion over responsibility. One said, access to abortion changed my life. Another says, anytime I'm able to think about my career on a normal trajectory and the fact that I was able to finish school, I can almost always tie it back to the abortion. Another says, if your girlfriend breaks her leg, you want to take her to the doctor instead of letting it linger, let it be a lingering issue that she has to deal with the rest of her life. 
your child is a lingering issue you have to deal with. Susan B. Anthony and other early feminists decried abortion as a way for men to dodge responsibility, and it still is. Today, abortion supporters see male irresponsibility as a positive good no matter who dies in the process. Because sometimes the mother does. By doing so, they've liberated men, but they have not liberated women. They have enslaved women to male lusts and given men a get-out-of-jail-free card. What kind of a self-centered worldview puts a father's dreams ahead of a child's life? As Susan B. Anthony would have argued, it's not a worldview that anybody who believes in women's rights should ever embrace. So much for logic. 